the last time I showed this was on Islesford. So I had this, where on earth is Taunton Bay, set on Islesford. Um, but now we are, okay, I get up to the different building. So character is a combination of qualities or features that distinguishes one thing from another. To characterize and describe the particular qualities or features of a thing, characterization is a summary of the defining features giving a thing its unique identity. So that's what I'm after in this program, characterizing, giving a characterization of Taunt and Bay. How does it differ from Magadoos River? How does it differ from you know, other similar bays, because they're all bays. So that's Hog Bay, which is the upper reach of French, of French Bay and then Taunton Bay. And beyond this, there are no more bays. You can see the agriculture, right, great agriculture nursery right there, those funny little floats on the water. Uh, what makes Taunton Bay Taunton Bay? So there are open bays like Sacco Bay and Casco Bay, which are big and broad, and Englishman and Machias Bays, which are sort of half broad. And then the narrow ones, which I call closed bays or sheltered bays, like the Bagadoos River, and like Costco and like Taunton Bay. And you see all these little bays that break off of Cobb's Cook Bay. If it were all one big lump, I mean, it's like taking your hand and opening it into lots of fingers. It's the same area, but it's all spread out in Cobb's Cook Bay. Taunton Bay is all of a piece joined to what's called the Taunton River, going up through Egypt Bay, uh, Taunton Bay, and Hog Bay there. And the Bagadoos is similar in that it branches and it's shallow and uh, it also has aquaculture in it. So here's Maine with Hancock County. Here's Hancock County with the watershed of Totten Bay. Here's the watershed with the bay itself. So all the rain and snow that falls on this red area drains down through the soil into Totten Bay making it a blend of fresh water and salt water, which is the key defining feature of an estuary. It has both salt water and fresh water. So here's that watershed. Here's where the fresh water comes in through all these little streams. There's no major river. It's all little tiny streams. But that whole piece of land drains into the bay and then the salt water comes in over tidal falls and through the carrying place. It's got a mixture of fresh water and salt water. Here's a property ownership map of Taunton Bay in the whole watershed. And looking at pollution dangers, here are the septic fields. Eastbrook has two in the watershed, Fletcher's Landing five, Township 10, nine, Waltham 10, Sullivan has 210, Hancock 271, and Franklin 513. So the danger of pollution, uh, this is very instructive. You see, the shoreline is broken up into lots of lots that could be developed, and many of them have been. That's a subdivision, you can tell, because it's some human mind broke that up. It's not natural division. Butler Point is all under one ownership for 70 acres there. Uh, and up here in Waltham, there's nothing. It's woods, it's uh, used for hunting and for logging. And when the climate that we have is that of South Carolina, as it's predicted is going to happen in not too many years, this, I predict, will be developed. Because right now, we can afford to let it be fallow, 
uh, from human purposes, but when there's an incoming population seeking an equitable climate to live in, they're going to claim this is going to be increasing pressure on Totten Bay. And the reason Totten Bay is as clear as it is now is because nobody lives in the watershed, or very few people, very few septic systems. And most of the septic systems are right here around the cluster density of the bay. So here are two different regimes. The island in the ocean is the converse of uh, Taunton Bay, a bay amid the, in the land, and the water So here, the water flows off the land into the bay. Here it does exactly the same thing, off the land and into the bay, but it goes, oh, it doesn't concentrate in the middle, it's diffuse and it radiates in all kinds of directions, from Somme Sound and into Blue Hill Bay and Frenchman Bay. That's eelgrass at its height, it's most dense, in Egypt Bay, and that's the desirable state of affairs because all this greenery is the nursery for many species that live down in it and can avoid diving ducks that would gobble them up in a minute, but they can't see them because they can't go through them. And Canada geese come along at low tide like this and nibble on the blades itself. Black ducks eat the periwinkles that are on the blades. So this is a habitat unto itself, but it is highly variable. It comes and it goes. So I think of it as having features that begin with an S. The bay with shifting salinity that is shallow, that is sheltered, it's inland, protected from the open ocean. It's sunny, so photosynthesis can go on, and it's sustained by photosynthesis. So if you can remember the S words, you got what an estuary is. That's our view from this window down on the pier in 1880, probably, 1885. All those paving stones cut to the specific dimensions required by a town, could be Albany, could be Baltimore, could be Philadelphia. Broadway in New York is paved with stones cut specifically uh, by people, lugged by horse down the track road and piled in the ship. Big ships, four masted scooters, and here's the ferry that took off from where the bridge is now in the salt, this is the Sullivan side, and this boat would power this barge which carried three Model A Fords or whatever they are. Before this, we were in the Stone Age, and the red paint people were right across the bay. We could see their encampment from this window if we were here then. This is 6,000 years ago. Uh, and they made their tools out of stone. These are clearly spear points. There's a gouge for hauling out wood. Here's a mortar or pestle. Here's a hammer stone. Here's a knife. And here's an axe that's sharpened on this end. That's a broken axe. So we don't want to forget these guys, and these are still buried in the softer sand around the whole bay. So we have a history that's in the bay. So here's a characterization at a glance. We have shallow subtidal flats. The water is always there, but it's about this deep at low tide. So eelgrass will grow there. It's not exposed. We have intertidal flats where they're dry at low tide, 
and the other grass doesn't grow there. You get the upper slopes of channel where mussels grow and horseshoe crabs hibernate in the winter just below the water line. And then we have channel, one main channel that goes all the way up, becomes braided at this point, braided again around Round Island and goes on up to East Franklin. So basically, Taunton Bay is a mud flat with a river flowing through it. And the mud, as you can see, dominates at low tide. It's a big deal, and that's where people harvest uh, clam worms and clams, and sandpipers come and feed. So it appeals as part of an ecosystem that is extremely important, but it looks bare. And 1960-something, or the early 60s, the town of Franklin wanted to build a dam across here to make this a half-tidal bay so that they could sell cottage lots around the edge and have access to open water and get rid of all those muddy mudflats. And the Inland Fish and Wildlife people put the kibosh to that. But there was a meeting. Dennis Vibert stood up and said he didn't think this was a good year, good move. It would upset the ecology of the whole bay. And people in the back said, shut up, you swear word, sit down. And Margaret Hendrickson, who is the uh, minister at the North Tullowood Church, wrote a letter saying you shouldn't do that. But those are the only two people who opposed it. But until Fish and Wildlife came in and said, no, you can't do that, it would be ecological suicide, uh, the town of Franklin, humans with their well-meaning motives to make a profit and to tailor the bay to their need, uh, were defeated in the end. Here are some landmarks. We're on a landmark. And I'll show you the pictures. You don't want to get caught in a canoe up going down these. Many people have been caught and they've been capsized by coming down. I'm amazed at how many people have drowned in Taunton Bay because of these falls. They've lost control going one way or the other. And, you know, probably 20 different people at different areas have been killed in our knowledge. Here's our fine 2000 Route 1 bridge. Here's the singing bridge. I can still remember the thrill of driving on this in the fog at night and meeting a trailer truck coming in. <laughs> <laughs> it was not fun, but everybody loved it because of the two tones that it had when your tires ran over the, the steel grid work here. And the tone changed because uh, I'm not sure which, which span one of these two could swing sideways if somebody went out and turned the crank and let ships, you know, tall ships come through. And that had a different grid work. And so you go humming along, mm -hmm. it would change when you cross that one. Four and four, we are here. Egypt Bay has the twinnies, two little tiny islands, eagle slope. They've got eelgrass when there is eelgrass coming up. And then right here is the borderline. This goes dry. This has some water at low tide. The low tide line is somewhere right in there. Steve, do you know the history of how Egypt Bay got its name? From the Copperopolis mine. Um, and why it was called that, I don't know. But I think it, Egypt was in the air somehow. I don't know the answer. But there was a Copperopolis mine in just up from Egypt Bay. Uh, and here, humans go out and study the creatures in the mud. This is Brian Beale leading a class out way to the middle of Hog Bay to study that. 
And Brian Breal never goes out under the mud without that tote behind him because there are places where there's spring water bubbling up through the mud and if you step in that place you sink like a stone and you can drown in a few seconds. Mm. It's dangerous and it looks like the place right next to it. And what are those called? Um, honey pots. Honey pots. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the sweet name for a very evil <laughs> situation. And you don't know where they are. Uh, so you learn if you're a clamor or a warmer. And that you grab hold of that, and that's what saves you. And then he grabs a hold of the edge and puts his arms on that and leans over it. And then he knows it's on solid ground because he carries it on a six foot rope. Right. And so he's still with us. But that's what it's like needs to remember. Here are the islands. Here's an aerial view Burying Island, Woodchuck Island. Butler Island, the Twinnies, and Egypt Bay. This is still connected to land. It's not technically an island, but it looks like an island. And Round Island up in Franklin. There's Woodchuck Island, and there actually, I remember in the 80s, there was a woodchuck hole in the bank right there with woodchuck. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenneth Crabtree was the one who told me he called it Woodchuck Island. Ground up. Oh. Did I show you this one? No. Mm -hmm. Let me go back to one. Anyway. Uh, so this is a detail of the island. The twinnies are right next to each other. Burying Island is the biggest island, 30 acres. Butler Island is very neat. It, uh, I think, is unbuildable because there's no park that's less than 75 feet from the shoreline, so I think it's going to stay. And Burying Island is where you spent two years of your life? Is that Pardon me? Burying Island is where you spent two years of your life? Or? That is true. And my family. Well, now LLC owns it, but I'm the manager of the LLC because we found that one of our owners went bankrupt and a bankruptcy court could force the partition of the island to sell off the share of the person who was bankrupt. And we have done everything we can to keep the integrity of the island, you know, the ecological integrity whole. So we said, well, the only way we can figure to prevent that is by forming an LLC, so the LLC owns it, and no court can sue them. And what the LLC does is the members pay the town taxes and plus maintenance fee. So, Burying Island, in my fantasy, will continue looking like that because there's a conservation easement on it, and it can't be developed, and people view it from offshore. It's a hazardous place because the tree branches are falling down all the time and you risk your life by walking there. Uh, I've been on a path and just seen trees fall either way just for no reason. You know, their time has come and so it's hazardous to your health. But, you know, people can walk on the shoreline and as long as they make no fires. So this is interesting in that this ledge, this island, Woodchuck Island, and Round Island all form a line. I can't see any ecological or geological significance in that fact. It's just a curiosity that it's kind of an axis with those islands on it. And there's an eagle nest there, there's an eagle nest there, eagle perches there, and they eat ducks sitting on this. So it's a future feature of eagle consciousness. <laughs> there is a channel, and I'll show you what it looks like. You can see it starting down here, comes up, splits, that branch goes up and 
terminates in e Egypt Bay, comes up another arm, drains Egypt Bay down that way, goes up here, turns into a braided channel, why there are two there, I don't know, and then braids again around Round Island, goes up, wiggles here, and then goes up to East Franklin. And so the depths, uh, this is the sill, the tidal falls, this is the high ground at the bridge, the bridge piers are resting on this high ground. Right here, this channel breaks off of that channel, and it's right there. So the little dotted line channel goes on up into Egypt Bay. This channel is this channel that breaks off. The depth off Butler Point right there is 60 feet. Suddenly it sinks down, I don't know why, uh, and then it gets shallower and shallower coming up until it's almost nothing and, uh, up here. And you can see, you know, that is basically plain mud that we're looking at. So here I locate the sill, that deep part off Butler Island, that channel, that channel, the braided channel. And none of this is evident at high tide, it all looks like one big solid bay. By the low tide, its secrets are revealed that it's really way more complicated and the flow of water is more complicated. An ecologist I read about the coast of Maine talked about the stress gradient in bays in Maine from open water, which has high salinity, to the inland waters that are much warmer shallower and have totally different uh, regimes of fish and so forth. So high stress is up here, but the predators that are down here in Frenchman Bay can't survive up there, so they don't go up there. So what's on the mudflat basically survives, uh, whereas if those species were down here, they would succumb. This is low stress down here, high water velocity, up here is low water velocity, low species diversity. There are very few species adapted to these red areas, but they appear by the millions or the billions because they don't have any predators. So they're very valuable for clam digging and worm digging. High temperature range, that is extremes of temperature. In the winter, they're cold. In the summer, they're way warmer than Frenchman Bay is moderate temperature range, low salinity range, high salinity range. And that's crucial because eelgrass depends on a high salinity range. It thrives when the salinity is below 18 parts per thousand. The animal that feeds on it thrives above 18 parts per thousand. So if there's not a lot of rain in April, and the bay up here is as saline as it is down here, the eelgrass dies because its uh, pest thrives and eats it up. So here's the primary producers, and if you study your ecology, they're primary producers, secondary uh, producers, and then consumers, three orders and then predators at the top. So here are kelp beds in the river and they're right off the end of the pier here at low tide you can see the kelp. Uh, eelgrass grows in these green areas. Rockweed on the rocky shores all around the edge. Diatomes on the mud and salt marsh up here in this dark green area. I'll show you pictures of them. Here's a salt marsh up, here's Hog Bay, here's rockweed on the rock around the edge, here's kelp in the water top of Sullivan, and there's eelgrass on the edge of the channel uh, coming up to the top of it. So those are the food producers and everything that lives in the bay depends in one way or another on these. Here's a picture taken in 1995 showing eelgrass in clumps 
around Varying Island Ledge. Here's Varying Island. Uh, so it's pretty generally on the western, southwestern side of Varying Island. Here it is, 1995. Here it is in 2007. None of that heliograph is there. It varied because we had years, we had dry years where the salinity wasn't suitable to producing heliograph. It's gone, bearing island ledge. Totally gone, totally different scene 15 years later. Here is September 1st, 1992, Eelgrass right next to Taunton Bay. This shelf here is this shelf here in 2007. So the bay is always changing, and human beings cannot control it. What happens is a matter of climate and weather. So it goes from that in 96 to that 10 years later, uh, and it just happens. You can't blame anyone. You can blame the climate. So here it is slowly recovering. It's recovered on this half, but not on this half. And it's kind of spotchy. And as far as I know, uh, it's still barren. That's my cabin, the roof of my cabin. So, the relationship between salinity and eelgrass is very complicated, but I, I think I can get a picture of it. This is 1973, the year of the heaviest snow melt since it's been recorded. So because the snow melted, eelgrass is very dense up in this area over there, down here. Um, and that's... It's, of all the historical pictures I've seen, that is the most dense year. Here in 1996, you see exactly where the eelgrass was there is outlined the non-eelgrass there. You see it's exactly the same heart shape as that. That triangle is that triangle. So where it was, it no longer is few years later. And here's the explanation. This is eelgrass production, which goes up with low salinity, up to 18 parts per thousand. And then there's a dividing line right here at 18 parts per thousand. The wasting disease predominates when there's no rain and the salinity is higher. So here, eelgrass thrives in this half, but it dies in that half. And so the eelgrass production looks like that. And the mussel production, on the other hand, looks like that. So here, the mussels and the eelgrass trade places. In the same habitat, here you have high uh, mussel populations, and here you have low mussel populations and high eelgrass populations. And that explains why that funny shape in the, in the picture turned from eelgrass to nothing, to mud, to basically um, habitat for great blue mussel. Does that make any sense? It took me eight years to figure that out. <laughs> okay, what happened? In October 2005, they made that much rainfall. What happened in October 2005? It must have been a hurricane. Hurricane Katrina, which dumped eight inches of rain on Maine in one day. That rain came all the way up here. So that's what made it the wettest year in 111 years was that hurricane. Here, on the other hand, is the driest year in 107 years, 2001. Now, when it's dry like that, and you can see it building up, building 
going up, and then it goes down, 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 down. 2001, uh, very dry, means eelgrass died in that year, and that's the year eelgrass totally disappeared from the bank. And then it takes a long time to recover. So it's in the history. You have to study your history to understand why these things happen. There's more grass. This is wind gusts above 25 miles an hour in 2005. January is high in the winter, low in February. Peaks in May. May has got the strongest wind of the year. Precipitously falls in June, July, and August. Lowest in August is the calmest, uh, least windy month of the year, which peaks into October and then declines in December. So look at this. This is when it's safe to go boating in bays like Taunton Bay. The June, July, and August are the times I row in the bay because I can't fight the winter winds. They're stronger than I am. This is a funny feature. The air temperature goes up and down every day. That's the orange graph, big swing. The bottom temperature at the bottom of the water is the blue line, and you can see it's the average temperature of the high and low of the air temperature. So it's Mr. Calm and Steady averaging out because it gives up its heat slowly and takes on heat slowly and is more conservative and clings to the middle with a few swing here and there. So you can predict what the bottom temperature is if you know the extremes of the air temperature. It's halfway in between the highs and the lows. I've shown you these. There's a year with temperatures below zero centigrade. Here's a dip in the spring when we frequently get winds off the Gulf of Maine from the east. So we get a series of days with east winds that cool us down so it looks like it's going up. It dips down with those east winds and then it goes up into summer. I remember this was six weeks of east wind in 2005 and it never warmed up. So instead of gradually joining up there, it just stayed the same. And so every year is different. You know, you can see the decrease here is different from the decrease there. So it's just the way nature is. Here's a drifter. I had a benthic, two benthic temperature thermometers in the bay, 2007 to 2009. This year, the winter was up and down, so there wasn't much ice in the bay. Here it was solidly cold, so there was ice in the bay that year. And there are different slopes to the way the temperature changed in these two years. This is a more, more gradual rise to the summer temperature. Here it's steeper. So here is the bay when it freezes over and the bottom temperature is really three degrees below freezing. And the bay looks like that. Here's me with my thermometer. There's the bottom thermometer, there's the anchor, and there are the two floats. So there are the anchors, there's the thermometer, and there are the floats that hold it vertical, which I drop in a deep place and then I go looking for, and I mark it on a GPS uh, computer so I know where it is. That's how I got those diagrams. The salinity in the bay increases slowly from April through November, very gradually, but it goes up and down, but it does increase. I put a two-gallon juice jar with a little sand in the bottom in the water as a buoy and mark it with a flag so I could see it and put it in at tidal falls at low tide and then just let it drift to see where it would go in the bay. 
And these are, it's course every 15 minutes on two different occasions. And it surprised me, it didn't end up in Hongbei, it stopped in Creasy Cove here, and deposited, it slowed, and the burden of sand and gravel it carried with it dumped right down in this area where Mike Briggs had his initial aquaculture uh, beds. And so they smothered his oysters. And we didn't anticipate that. I did this after the fact, after that happened. So this is the high, the limit of the incoming tide. And this water is highly influenced by the water that comes down from East Franklin. This is a water purity, water quality. Um, we had one member, a friend of Totten Bay, who religiously went out and measured water temperature of this water purity in the streams around the bay. And these are the names of the sites that the state designates around the bay. So it gives me confidence that they're at least measuring this salinity every year. And they would go, and after it rained, they would go out and measure uh, the salinity and the purity of the water. So that's bay water they're sampling, not water coming in from the streams. No, it's bay water influenced by the stream. So it's half stream and half bay. Okay. So it's at the mouth of the stream. And on the basis of that, they close the bay if they think it's too impure. So these are eight flats in the bay that were closed, very shallow with homes, usually from septic pollution, pollution from upstream failed septic systems. That then they go and they determine which system has failed and they uh, get a change. But you know, it was, from East Franklin to Franklin, over here to Hancock, Hancock Herring Place, down here right where we are now. And it's undoubtedly changed since I made this map. This is 10 years old. And there's no municipal sewage treatment plants. It's all uh, septic in that area. No. Um, not that I know of. It's all up to individual property owners to put in a septic system. That's, you know, the rural character of this yeah. area. <clears throat> and it's also your duty to get your water supply. You know, so you put it in your well. So you have your will and your septic system. And the relationship between the two is up to you. So these are species in the Bay of Special Concern. Horseshoe crabs, because they're so ancient, and it's so hard to know where they are and how many of them there are, which is why at Frank Dorsey's house they do an annual count just to see how they're doing. Canada geese depend on eelgrass, so when the eelgrass goes out, the Canada geese don't show up. The winter ducks depend on mussels and the amount of ice on the bay. Shorebirds depend on Corophium biotator, which is a weird looking mosquito weed kind of thing that lives in the mud. And if the wormers turn over the mud, they mask the food that these guys eat. So they depend on the harvesting of that. Harbor seals depend on not being bothered and by the number of eel wives who come into the bay. Eagles, we have five nests in the bay. Um, which is remarkable for a small bay this size. So we have more than our share. So I showed you in the horseshoe crab uh, PowerPoint, I showed this slide that these are all the data points in Hog Bay of 13 crabs in their motions, and here in Egypt Bay, 13 crabs. And they all stayed within these circles. And right here, you see the cold water from Frenchman Bay comes in. And right there, it's right next to the land. So this is a stretch of cold water. So these guys don't ever cross that barrier. And these guys, uh, I don't know, they probably are escapees from this. They probably go there. And these, I would say, are related to that group. 
Um, but when we started the study, we thought they went out to the Gulf of Maine and lived out there. But no, they never leave the bay. And what is really astounding is half of their life, every year, they spend in hibernation. Half of their life is given to eating rapidly, reproducing, and then going back and finding a place to hibernate. So, I mean, that's a pretty short life. Their life span is cut in half so that they sleep during the winter. And I showed this in the horseshoe crab one. Here is November of 2003, and it's also April 04. This is where that crab hibernated. May 04, I picked it up there. Now that's October 04, where it's hibernating. So it woke up there in April, went over there, wide swing all through uh, the whole bay, went around Round Island, came over here, and hibernated there. So its yearly travels are in that diagram. That's, that's its trajectory for 2004. Here's all the recorded sightings that I had, or I picked them up on sonar in Egypt Bay for the same year. And here's one, April 04, woke up there, moved around here, down there, down there. These positions are different days I went out to catch them. Went up there, probably reproduced right there at that point. Came out here, looked for a place, and hibernated. In November was right there, so instead of being there, it moved. <coughs> So, you know, it's interesting to follow the course of one particular horseshoe crab, and we did that with 26. So we know they all stayed within those, those <coughs> limits. They're local, and they never cross this, you know, it's like a wall. I showed this picture. This is a male horseshoe crab with walking legs, with pushing legs that splay out claspers that the male holds onto the female with, and blue muscles which weighted down the reason its, its tail is sticking out of the water like this, because it's weighted down by the weight of those living muscles that attach to its shell, and it can't move. And I kept riding it, but it kept ending up like this. Uh, so I think when the tide came in, it could probably walk on the bottom and ride it. So, but his days were numbered. This is Delaware, where you have horseshoe crabs coming in. This is all good breeding habitat. Little layer of gravel on top of sand. And people walk on the beach and they tweak the horseshoe crabs. Here is the shore of Egypt Bay. Now that is terrible habitat for horseshoe crabs, so I ask the question, why do they bother with Taunton Bay? Why are they here? And what they do is they find this little breeding plot of gravel with sand under it, so they go bumping into rocks and they come down here and down here, find a little gravel there, a little gravel there. So our main horseshoe crabs are hardy and determined and persistent. They have character. <laughs> and I detected three different behaviors I could observe during the two week breeding period digging holes to breed in, traveling along like that, and then nesting. There's a female and three males, there's a female and a male. And you see, here are the boulders, there's the boulder, here's the ledge. But they find a place, they're persistent. They, they're survivors. They've survived for 450 million years. Obviously, they are driven to survive, to find the conditions. So, the red is nesting 
yellow is digging, and this is traveling. So of the horseshoe crabs, I counted on these days. This was the peak day, and you can see a peak in temperature. They really like that. Here's the, the temperature is down and that, so they don't like that. And they go up and down, and their numbers depend on the temperature. This line, at least here, temperature matters, and they suit themselves to the temperature. When the temperature goes down, their numbers of reading go down. At this point, it's too late, and they just have at it any time. You can see the striped tillyfish here that dive in under the female as she's laying her egg and eat the egg. That's how they survive. So the, here's a little rare niche that's available two weeks out of the year is that they can gulp down and survive on the basis of the calories they keep in. in. Delaware, here's a small female and my foot. Here in Taunton Bay is Egypt Bay, an average female, a small male, and my big foot. And you see it's less wide, the male is less wide than my foot, it's half an inch narrower. So that's my gauge for the size of ocean crab. And here they are, this is what breeding looks like. Here's a breeding pair, here's a breeding pair. Can't tell about these or that one. I think this is another breeding pair. And they breed in the mud. There's been muddy water for them on gravelly shores for 450 million years. So it, you know, you can't have any visibility, but they don't depend on eyesight. They go on pheromones and scents in the water. So the conclusion of horseshoe crabs. The numbers in Egypt Bay are affected by shoreline water temperature, the nature of the substrate, whether it's gravel or lead, the time of high tide. If the high tide is at noon, the tide comes in all morning over warm rocks on a sunny day, so the shoreline temperature goes up and no more apt to breed. And that depends on the lunar phase when the high tide is, depends on weather and on seasonal water temperature. So it all depends on the, not to, some people say it's the moon, but it's really the tide that they're after. When the sun rises in the morning, warms the rocks, heats the rocks, the heat in the rock is transferred to the water, which goes to the ocean beds, and they breed in either Bay. It took me a long time to figure out why they were here. They're here because the sun in that low stress, area, that high stress area, in shallow water, provide the conditions that they need to breathe. Canada geese, you can see one with a frond of eelgrass in its mouth, that's what it feeds on, that's why they're here. Is And during their migration flights in the fall, they come for the eelgrass, and if there's no eelgrass, they fly over. And I always love seeing the Canada geese. The golden eyes, the buffalo heads, eat blue mussels, that's why they're here in the bay. They dive down in this crack in March to eat the mussels that are exposed on the bottom. Shorebirds, he's here because he is camouflaged for this habitat. Where the critters are that he eats, or she eats, you can see that and that is a mi mixture of brown and white, just like that. Here they are spending the high tide when they're highly vulnerable on a ledge off of Marrying Island. Uh, the numbers are down. Here's a small flock of young coming back in September of 2007. And I'll show you that foot. They're called semi-palmated sandpipers because this, these two toes aren't connected by a web, but those two toes are. So it's half palmated, 
and web. I'm showing you this the ring bill gulls that are characteristic of Mountain Bay. We don't have a lot of herring gulls like Mountain Bay, Rhode Island. At low tide, an hour before low tide, after the two hours, they soar over the mud flaps. They stall just like that. They stop, they see something. What are they after? They go under the water, their wings can stay dry on top of the water, and they find a worm, a worm, a worm. And here's two gulls after the same worm gliding. And they gulp down the worm and they take off. And then the rest of the time, when they can't feed, they roost on the very island ledge and just do nothing. So their lifestyle is at low tide, they do this and they're furiously active and they burn all their calories and gain all their calories doing this. And the rest of the time, they loaf and burn as few calories as possible. They share the legs with the nursing seal, cute as can be, but helpless. These are the seal rocks in Creasy, Creasy Cove. This is hatch point here, comes around, and the seals go on these rocks. And if I stop my boat, they'll all swim away. So I take pictures along this arc as I cruise up here. So I'm looking from this angle, this angle, this angle, this angle, this angle. And I assemble my pictures from different angles and try to find out how many seals really are there. And this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy, and this guy are the same. But in the middle, well, this one is the same as that one but it's not in the other pictures, so I tease out the number of different seals, count them, and I got 77 seals in the bay, plus or minus, you know, probably another seven or so. So for this year when I took these pictures, which I think was 2005, I would have said there were 77 seals, and other years I've seen only 10. So their numbers go up and down too. And that's one mating colony, that, that uh, 70, some of them. That, that's one male and one mating colony. Yep. Yeah. And boy, he resents other seals that come in from outside. They battle. So he defends his territory and his harem. So the current eagle nest in 2005 with the green, one on Falls Point, one on Bering Island, two on Butler Point, very close together. And I would say those are founded by siblings hatched from the same nest so that they could be in such a close range, and then one on Round Island. And then these are historical nests where this pair that has that nest also had nests. They move around, they had some over here, here. Here. So, lovely bird, I've told you about the, I was driving down Route 1 and a Massachusetts car right in front of me stopped and pulled over to the side, suddenly, and the guy got up and I got, I stopped behind him to see what the problem was. There's an eagle! There's an eagle! He wasn't used to seeing them. Uh, and there was one, they fly over Route 1 at the ferry place all the time. Magnificent bird. Fisheries, the pronounced one in the bay is lobsters. Here's a lobster fisherman. He throws out the catch he doesn't want, and these guys gobble it up. The lobster fishery is really exemplary. They have trap limits limited entry to the fishery, apprenticeships that train their young guys, maximum and minimum size limits, escape vents for undersized lobsters to get out of the trap, they V-notch female meals so they won't be taken, they have regional zone councils, and they have participatory self-regulation. You know, they are really living up to preserving the catch that they uh, 
are after. Every lobster fisher is a steward and proud of it. And that's an example of a well-regulated, because self-regulated, they came up with this, not the state of Maine, they came up and governed themselves. On one tide, I mapped every lobster buoy in the bay, and you can see they're totally in the channel. They follow the deep water. The lobsters are down in the channel. They're not exposed on the mud flat on either side. This is elver fishery. Uh, and here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. How does, uh, you know, these are the little eels that are this long that this year caught, brought in $2,000 a pound. So that's why all these nets are out there. And they're supposed to leave adequate room for the elvers to get up here. But with nine nets at the mouth of one stream, I don't know how anybody survived. These are alewives. These guys don't know it, but they're caught in a trap here in Franklin. Clams, backbreaking labor, even getting them under the water, muscle dragging. Here's a mussel reef off of Bering Island. There's one off of Evergreen Point. Uh, and this is what they look like when they, this is over at uh, Falls Point where Christian Bay Conservancy has its headquarters. Here are periwinkles, starfish, and blue mussels. And this is the basis of a whole food web. Uh, the, the blue mussels are under Greece, underneath the eelgrass. In Canada, geese harvest the eelgrass. Horseshoe crabs eat blue mussels. Diving ducks eat blue mussels. Eagles and falcons eat diving ducks in the wintertime. Hunters shoot diving ducks to come in and kill them. Marine worms uh, live for blue mussels. Divers, draggers, hand rakers harvest blue mussels. So that's the industry of Taunton Bay. One thing leads to another. And here you can see, this is an aerial photograph, you can see the tracks of where the mud has been uh, dug up looking for worms. So, the fisheries, lobsters, elvers, alewives, clams, blue mussels, marine worms. And we're talking millions of dollars for the worms that are taken out of the bay. Uh, Barbara Arter did an economic study of Cotton Bay. And I think she said take of the worms was two million dollars for a whole season. And they're found primarily baked, right? They're, they're used for baked. Aquaculture has a big toehold on the bay, and you'd never know it. Uh, University of Maine Center for Cooperative Aquaculture took over the the Dobscott salmon farm that went broke in the 90s. And then the USDA Saltwater Agriculture Research Station came up here to try to breed disease resistant salmon and trout, which they do in this facility. Uh, and you can go down there and take tours, and it's very interesting. Here, halibut are swimming around in these tanks, being artificially fed and monitored by human beings. And you know, a halibut could be this long. It's swimming around, so I feel sorry for the halibut, but they're slated for the market anyway. They're delicious. <laughs> this is their aquaculture feeding room. This robot has grain in those bins. It stops over every one of these tanks and gives it a dose of grain uh, 
at frequent intervals throughout the day. And it, it's really creepy being in this room. And this thing has a mind that's going, it's only that's going from one tank to another, feeding them. So it's all automation. You know, maybe it would take five people to do that feeding. But no, there are no people. And this is the result. They have bins full of salmon and trout. This is aquaculture carried out in the open in Mike Briggs oyster uh, operation in Hog Bay, here's the view of Scudic Mountain. And these are his nursery trap, nursery and full of oysters, and then he puts them on the bottom to grow out, and he sends divers down to pick them up and harvest them when they're ready for market after two years. And occasionally he misses one, and you get an oyster, there's a couple on the table that are this small. They just keep growing and growing and growing. Here's the lobster boat. In winter, even scallop dip diving, he's got a wetsuit. He goes down the line and dives when the snow is on the ground. Here, the University of Maine crew is sampling the bottom to see what's in the mud column. Lots of boating on the bay, from kayaks to power boats to fishing boats to canoes. And every summer I see a couple of these guys come into the bay and zoom around and zoom out. And here's the result of going too close to birds. These birds are roosting, saving energy on the ledge, and the people who kayak right by didn't even see the birds, but they disturbed it. And so the birds fly up, expend calories that uh, they would rather not expend because of curiosity. This is right down the corner here in Sullivan, a used car lot that drains oil from the crankcase drippings down into the kelp beds down below. That's not a good sighting. You know, that shows poor planning or lack of planning. Here's the house that's grandfather with a groom lawn right down to the edge of the bay. So any dog waste or fertilizer they put on the lawn slopes down to the bay and comes into the bay. And that's only because this house was built before Charlene and Zoning, so they were grandfathered. There are exceptions. Another hazard is just bank erosion. And um, next week I'll show, well, I may, like, if there's time after this, show the uh, erosion PowerPoint that I have. But here's the bank. All the gravel on the beach is caused by gravel in the soil left by the glacier. And so we have gravelly beaches where this happens. So in a sense, this is refeeding the beach, but it's also, this soil will never come again. It's decreasing. Here's the view across the bay of the Esker. This was the course of a river draining the glacier that came over this part and dropped sand and gravel and it is eroding here. You can see the tide came up here, undercut the bank, the bank slumps, and with it, soil that's on the top of the bank slumps and ends up down here. And here's a huge mat. This is five feet of soil. So five feet of sand has been undercut, letting the bank slump. And this is rapidly going. Here's the erosion taking the bank out from under the soil on the top. Uh, and these days are numbered. There's nothing you can do to stop it. So here's my list of what makes Taunton Bay Taunton Bay. Highly enclosed by land, many small streams, a thousand septic systems plus, unique history and prehistory, multiple interacting habitats, one big mud flat, with a channel running through it, stress gradient, wooded islands, failing septic systems, diverse food producers, variable climate conditions, variable habitat, 
dynamic species relationships, complex species relationships, ongoing erosion and sedimentation, species of special concern, orchard crabs on the edge, geese dependent on eelgrass, and so forth. So it's a unique place. There is no place in the world like Cotton Bay. It has a unique combination, a unique shape, unique temperature of the water. And that's why horseshoe crabs are here and not in Skillings River, because its features, which is right next door, you think they'd be there. But that's too cold because it doesn't have the sandy shallows like Cotton Bay. Uh, so it is what it is because of the conditions in the bay. So characterizing Taunton Bay is like characterizing any bay. It is extremely complicated and variable year to year as conditions change. And as global warming comes on, it's going to change and we're going to do a different mix of species. And I think the human population is going to move to follow the equitable climate. And I see change in the next 50 years that we can't anticipate. And the question is, can we do anything about it? We want to cling to what we have, but there's going to be tremendous pressure for human group living space. And I would say that's going to win it out, is my prediction. <laughs> So here's a word about stewardship. So that's my take home message. It's up to us. And that's why I made this PowerPoint to educate us of what in Mountain Bay. You could do that for the Bagadoos River, for Skilling River, for Freshman Bay, whatever. So you see, it's very dynamic. All the parts are interacting. You remove one part and it changes. And climate is going to rule you know, in the end. So it seems to me we can turn our backs in the bay, or we can take a responsibility and do what we can. Uh, and I have no idea what the best way to proceed is. Mm -hmm. um, Great.